Hello and welcome to today's webinar from the Field Pusher Silicon Valley team. Very happy that you're joining us today. We're going to be talking about the Digital Services Act or the DSA. And maybe this is something that you've been giving some thought to and you've been tracking last year. Maybe you even started thinking about how the DSA applies to your organization and your services. Or maybe you've even gone the further step and you've actually started on some of the compliance work to make sure that you're going to meet that deadline in just over a month or around five weeks time when the DSA goes live on the 17th of February. But in any event, now's a good opportunity to take stock, um, have a refresher on what the DSA is all about, get an overview of who it applies to and what are some of the key obligations. That's what we're going to be talking through today. And uh, today I'm joined by my boss and our US managing partner, Mark Weber. My name is Richard Lorne, I'm a senior associate on the team, and we also have Eilish Beebe, who's a member of our Silicon Valley team, but based in the UK. So those are our speakers, and we're going to be, as I say, talking about the DSA, walking through some of uh, its scope and scoping questions, and talking through some of the obligations. But before we dive into the detail, I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's going to help set the scene and provide a little bit of context as to how we've got here. Thank you, Richard, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, the DSA forms one part of the EU's digital agenda. The first phase focused on the EU initiatives to promote growth, digital services in the EU, but also included the introduction of our old favourites, the GDPR and the e-privacy directive. So we've been there for a while and we really need to think about the DSA as it intermingles with some of that other regulation. The second phase of this digital agenda focuses on what they call the digital services package. And this aims to address the rapid rate of changes in technology by providing comprehensive rule book for online platforms. When we say a comprehensive sort of advancement in technology, we're really just talking about the volume of content and the volume of information being shared by different platforms out there on the internet. And the DSA has been introduced to introduce the and address the diverging rules for online services in the EU with the increased availability of illegal or unsafe products within all that digital content I've been talking about. And as much you know, trailed with uh, Twitter, Now X and various other online platforms, the prevalence of hate speech, misinformation, inappropriate content online, and an insufficient incentive for the online services providers that are putting them, that content online to address the online harms. So we're really thinking about content and the harm that that can provide uh, and, um, and thinking about now how that may be regulated. And we'll find out it's regulated in a number of different ways. But the DSA is implemented as an EU regulation and that regulation applies to intermediary services. Um, and more on that from Eilish in a little while. But these services are services that are offered to individuals or businesses in the EU. Um, and in practice, this captures an extremely broad range of digital services from the SaaS platform uh, to with an EU presence or an EU customer base, all the way through to an online content sharing forum. And transparency and accountability are core principles of this DSA project and things that we'll come back to time and again in this webinar. Um, so the DSA in particular updates the liability regime for intermediary services. And that liability regime is contained within the e-commerce directive. That was first introduced back in 2000. You know, looking back in my long career, I, I was a very junior lawyer at that point, but uh, the e-commerce e directive is still there and the DSA doesn't intend to replace that e-commerce directive but it does seek to harmonize the way member states of the EU generally approach liability exemptions and the, the e-commerce directive uh, in general. And you know, because over time, and as you can imagine, over the course of nearly 24 years, the approaches member state by member state have varied greatly. And, um, and sometimes it hasn't had the focus that perhaps it deserves. In particular, it hasn't had the focus uh, it, with, with a view to, to thinking about all of this new technology. Um, so the, these new obligations relating to content moderation, recommendation systems, dark patterns and digital advertising have all been long promoted 
um, and talked about. But these obligations are tiered based on the nature and size of the service, with most onerous obligations reserved for the online platforms, and even more onerous obligations for those very large online platforms on there. So while some of the big tech players have been complying and thinking about this for a little while, the majority of the DSA provisions apply from the 17th of February 2024. So yeah, this is kind of why we're here. We're six weeks to go. This is regulation which has talked about, have been talked about for a long time. Um, there was the sort of thing that was even being trailed way before the pandemic. But but all of a sudden we're here. It may be applying to you, and we just want to help you think a little bit about does it apply to me? How might it apply to me? And help you think about some of that categorization. Um, why should you be doing it? Well, because others uh, are doing it and, it and it's the law, but also because there may be consequences. And member states are responsible for enforcing this DSA and their provisions. And for this, the member state must appoint a digital services coordinator. And then within that, with through that coordinator on a state by member state by member state basis, this coordinator has enforcement powers. So it could conceivably block services which aren't complying with the DSA, but also they have the power to fine, and they can fine up to 6% of global annual turnover. So um, if you hadn't had your mind focused by the, uh, the GDPR e-privacy kind of rules, here's yet another reason to, to think about fines uh, and, uh, and consequences. But let's park that for a moment, and let's just have a little look at what's happened so far, because I managed, I mentioned that we've been talking about this for a while, and that's because the proposals um, uh, for DSA and this digital agenda had been around a long time, in fact, almost 10 years. But the DSA came into force on the 16th of November, 2022, and the majority of its provisions apply to service providers, as I said, from the 17th of February, 2024. However, some online platforms were required to publish information about their average active service recipients by the 17th of February 2023. So almost a year ago, we were talking about this for one moment. Uh, and that was essentially publication of information and statistics from individual platforms to enable the European Commission to establish which service providers could be designated as very large online platforms or VLOPs or very large online search engines or VLOSs. Um, essentially, you know, a, a higher level of regulation implied. Uh, for the VLOPs and VLOSs, and they had to comply with their obligations within four months of their designation. So for a handful, and I guess maybe not a handful, 10 to 15 businesses, the very large, the very big household names, they're already in this, and we're really not talking to them, and I'm sure um, they're not thinking about this uh, all that much or, uh, right now, because yeah, they're in that regime and have been since they've been designated in April 2023. Um, and these very large businesses know who they are. They've been lobbying. They've been engaged. What we're really thinking about today is uh, is, is those of you who you know, have maybe thought you're not one of the big guys and you can postpone this and you can postpone this and you can postpone this. And all of a sudden we're at February uh, or almost at February 2024. So we've seen a few things happen in the meantime. Um, the European Commission has launched a transparency database back in September of 2023, and currently only the VLOPs and the VLOSs are required to submit their statements of reasons, something Richard, I think, will explain a little longer, but these statements of reasons being submitted to this DSA transparency database, and in time, as in uh, February of 2024, um, that database will uh, and disclosure requirement will reply to all online platforms. And this database, as a publicly available database, which will allow anyone to access and download the information made available by platforms regarding their content moderation and their decisions in relation to that content moderation. So one level of transparency, which we've seen for the big, but will be coming to the masses. Um, and just to give you an idea of what this means, this transparency database offers a real-time snapshot of the content moderation decisions. As of today, it's only this 10 to 15 companies, the VLOPs and VLOSs, but 
Um, there are you know, well over a billion statements uh, submitted since the launch in September, and that averages something like 105,000 statements per hour per platform, which is really quite, you know, quite phenomenal. And to think we're just going to add to that in, in, in due course is, is really, you know, really quite amazing. So at the same time, in, in, well, not at the same time, but in, in the past, in 2023, We've also seen the European Commission launch its digital services terms and conditions database. Online platforms must make their terms and conditions available in that clear and easily accessible and machine readable format. So the database provides an index of online terms to provide better clarity and for fairness for users. In time, the European Commission expects that this uh, that users will be able to view the recent changes made to online terms by the platform operators and retrieve previous versions. A new level of transparency, a new level of trackability for these fair terms which online uh, platforms uh, are publishing. Then, then finally, one final thing that happened in 2023, while we saw some designations um, uh, of, of very large platforms, in December 2023, a second tranche of very large platforms were des designated. Uh, including three adult content platforms, um, that, you know, essentially big names in the world of porn, uh, and um, you know, we've we've seen you know some extension and further thought from the European Commission about who and who isn't um, caught in the very large uh, environment. Now, yeah, you know, we realise the very large players, as I said, understand and have thought and have lobbied about this. We're really here today talking to those of you who I think are dialed in, um, who perhaps aren't caught and perhaps have been thinking about this as a project for 2024. We're now building up to the 17th of February, 2024. We've got roughly six weeks to get some of this in order. Let's therefore take a deeper look into what the DSA is trying to achieve. And I'll hand over to Eilish to explain some of the liability regime and some of the thoughts around which businesses may be caught and which businesses may fall outside of the DSA. Great, thank you, Mark. And thanks to all our listeners for joining. So the objective of the DSA is that it aims to protect EU individuals by preventing illegal content so that includes hate speech, disinformation, terrorist propaganda, and things like child pornography. The aim is to regulate online intermediaries that offer their services in the EU, so that will include hosting services, social media platforms, content sharing platforms, online marketplaces and search engines. So Mark touched on the e-commerce directive uh, just now and the existing liability regime that the DSA seeks to harmonise. The, the DSA updates that liability regime for online services, but does not seek to make substantial changes. So, for example, the DSA applies to illegal content, which it defines as essentially any information that does not comply with EU or member state law. It covers information that is illegal by its nature, such as illegal hate speech, discriminatory language and terrorist content, but also information that relates to illegal activities, such as sharing images that depict child sexual abuse or content that infringes intellectual property rights, such as copyright and trademarks. Intermediary services, so that includes mere conduits, caching and hosting services and online platforms, won't be liable for the information or content that they receive, store, transmit or access on behalf of their users under certain conditions and they vary depending on the nature of the service. So for example, mere conduits cannot be held liable for the information that they transmit so long as they don't initiate the transmission select the receiver or modify the information that's being transmitted. Hosting services and online platforms can't be held liable for the information that they host and disseminate so long as they do not have actual knowledge of illegal activity or content and they act, act expeditiously to remove and disable access to illegal content that they become aware of. Providers also will continue to benefit from this liability shield if they choose to make voluntary, good faith and diligent efforts to identify, remove or disable access to illegal content or take other measures in order to comply with their obligations under both EU and member state law, and that includes the DSA. 
But we note that the DSA doesn't create an obligation for intermediary services, so those mere conduits, the caching and hosting services and online platforms, they won't generally or proactively need to monitor the content on their platforms. And it's worth noting as well that online marketplaces also won't be able to rely on this liability shield under consumer protection law if the design of their online platform would lead the average consumer to believe that the information, product or service that's subject to the transaction is provided either by the platform itself or by a trader who's acting under the platform's control. There are some new obligations that Mark's already alluded to. So broadly, we've got some new takedown, transparency and reporting obligations for different types of intermediaries. And we'll continue to explore that in later slides. There's some additional obligations for those very large online platforms and search engines that have in excess of 45 million monthly active users within the EU. And just to touch back on some of the enforcement and cooperation um, under the DSA, the DSA establishes a harmonised enforcement framework that involves national authorities, the EU Commission and the European Board for Digital Services. So maximum fines there of up to 6% of global annual turnover. But fines can also be issued of up to 1% of the provider's annual turnover for violations such as misleading the authorities, providing incomplete or incorrect information, or even a failure to tolerate an inspection from the authority. So if I pass back to Richard to talk through some of the uh, services that fall in scope of the DSA. Great, <clears throat> thank you Eilish. So we've um, provided an overview and a glance of the DSA. It's worth spending a few minutes just talking about which services are within scope. And that's because the DSA includes a number of different terms and definitions for the types of services that it regulates. And this is really important to understand what those services are because the obligations that apply depend on the type of service. So when you're thinking about the DSA and it applies to you, in your mind you really have to have at the forefront what type of service are we providing and therefore which requirements are actually going to apply to us under this regime. So as a starting point Eilish already mentioned that the DSA applies to intermediary services that uh, are offered to recipients established or located in the EU. So that captures a very broad range of services the term intermediary services, that's the catch-all definition for all of the services within scope of the DSA. And it applies both to intermediary services that are actually established in the EU, as well as those who are established outside the EU, but that target their services to recipients in the EU. Now, when we're talking about recipients, we're really talking about users or customers. And the DSA doesn't make a distinction between B2C or B2B. It could be uh, users that are individuals or consumers, or it could be customers that are traders or enterprise. All types of recipients um, effectively are covered. So we have this broad scope of intermediary services, and that includes three categories. The first is mere conduits, which Eilish has already mentioned. Those are services that transmit information through communications networks or provide access to communications networks. So for example, that could include more technical types of communications such as internet exchange points and wireless access points, but it could also include interpersonal communications such as email, SMS, VoIP, etc. The second category are caching services. So again, these are services providing more of a technical function. They transmit Pardon me, they offer automatic, intermediate, and temporary storage of information for the sole purpose of making the transmission of that information more efficient. So here we're thinking about reverse proxies, content delivery networks, content adaptation proxies. Those two categories, mere conduits and caching services, they are actually subject to the, the smallest number of obligations under the DSA. So for the purposes of today, we're really going to be focusing on the third category, which are the hosting services. They're subject to more obligations. What's a hosting service? Well, that's a service that stores information at the user's request. 
that term store, it's not a term of art and there's no definition, but essentially we're talking about a service that hosts information or stores information on behalf of the user or customer, and that's provided as part of the service. So that's narrower than, for instance, when we're talking about processing under the GDPR, storage actually has to form part of that service, but it still captures a very broad range of different types of providers. They may be web hosting or cloud hosting uh, services. It could also include content sharing platforms and the like. Then we start to move up into the uh, higher tiers, and that might include online platforms. Um, so those are hosting services that actually both store the information at the user's request, but also disseminate that information to the public. And we'll come on to talk about what that means exactly. There's also a type of online platform, uh, which is the marketplace, which is a platform that allows consumers to enter into distance contracts with traders. And then lastly, we have the VLOPs and the VELOZES, the very large online platforms and very large online search engines. Those are essentially platforms and search engines that have at least 45 million average uh, users in the EU. So there's a range of different services. On the next slide, what we're gonna do is just consider that really important question. Are your services in scope and how do they qualify in the DSA? And as a starting point, one thing to mention is that here we're not thinking about uh, the company or organization as a whole necessarily. You need to break down the DSA and think about it on a service by service basis. And that's because uh, the DSA seeks to re regulate those services and therefore you only need to consider the, regulate, uh, the requirements that actually apply to the service that you're providing. So first of all, here's one question to consider. Does the service transmit information through communications networks or provide access to communications networks? In that case, you might qualify as a mere conduit under the DSA. So that's, for instance, if you're providing users with the ability to uh, uh, communicate or message others, either through some kind of email function, SMS, etc. And maybe that's uh, you're providing the back end service, or maybe you're providing access to a third party communications network. But in any event, if you're actually handling those communications on behalf of third parties and your customers, then we're looking at a mere conduit. The, se the second question is whether the service actually stores information at the user's request. So, Again, that's a very broad term, but if storage is part of the service, then you would qualify as a hosting service. And that includes maybe you're a SaaS platform, maybe you're a cloud storage provider, maybe um, you're a content sharing service. There are all types of services that might be caught within that question. And, and Richard, it's worth thinking about this one because I think this is the one where we're finding a number of clients and contacts have thought, well, I'm not an online platform, I'm not one of the big platforms, but uh, a hosting service you know, it may well be, and there are a number of, you know, as you say, SaaS platforms which host information on behalf of the, uh, uh, of the user. They may not be disseminate, disseminating, they may not be sharing, as you'll come on to talk about that online platform definition, but it's definitely one to think about because um, while there are fewer obligations, as we'll see, it's definitely uh, uh, something which more are caught by than perhaps they first think. And then typically you might not think of yourself as um, primarily responsible for that content, that's your customer's data, that's your user's data, but here you're an intermediary and that's exactly uh, the, the types of providers that the ESA is targeting. So even though you're not primarily responsible for the information, you are, ho you are hosting it, you're storing it, and therefore the DSA is going to target you and actually impose some obligations on you as that intermediary. So the third question on this slide is whether the service uh, actually stores information on behalf of the user, but also at the same time disseminates that information to the public. And here that word disseminate, that's actually a term of art. Uh, it's defined under the DSA. And what it means is, are you making information available to potentially an unlimited number of third parties at the user's request? Breaking that down, that really means that through the service, you're making the user's information easily accessible. It's easily accessible to potentially an unlimited number of third parties. And 
that all takes place without further action actually required by the user. So the most obvious example of that might be a social media platform. If somebody posts some kind of content, a video, a message, a post, and that's instantly accessible to other users on the service, then that is uh, dissemination, and therefore we're looking at an online platform. But the definition um, is actually quite broad, and it can potentially capture a number of other scenarios as well. Basically, if there's an element of sharing information with others, then we're thinking that's, that's possibly dissemination. But something to point out there is we, we're referencing the public, but that could include as well users that actually have to register to use a service, so maybe they have to create an account and log in. But if all of that is pretty easy to do and there's no element of human review, they can just uh, hop online, create their own account and log in, then that's still considered the public for DSA purposes. We have a bit of a, a caveat here though. So the DSA doesn't necessarily apply to all uh, types of services that include that sharing element. If the dissemination is simply a minor and ancillary feature of the service, then that doesn't necessarily qualify it as an online platform. So the most obvious example here is the comments section of a newspaper and the New York Times or maybe the BBC or the Guardian. Here users can actually post comments and reviews, um, but that is really ancillary to the main publication service and therefore doesn't mean that the New York Times or the Guardian necessarily becomes a platform. Two other things to mention there is that uh, a cloud or web uh, hosting service, that's generally not going to be considered a platform if it's merely providing the infrastructural support for people to publish their websites or to publish their other types of platforms. And the other one is um, an interpersonal communication service. That's also not a platform, even though you're allowing people to share information and send information to others. And that's because in that context, the information isn't being made available to the public. It's more direct one-to-one -one or one-to-many communications. And therefore that is considered a mere conduit. It's not considered a platform. Lastly, just to quickly mention, we also have online marketplace. So if you qualify as an online platform, but you also allow users acting as consumers to enter into distance contracts with other users who are acting as traders, i.e. some kind of B2C uh, forum, then you are going to qualify as an online marketplace and there are some additional rules that apply to you as well. So that gives you an idea about the types of services that are regulated and maybe that's giving you some food for thought as to how maybe the DSA applies to you. Let's move on now and we're going to be talking about uh, what the obligations are. So this is going to this is providing a snapshot, and I think, Eilish, are you, are you talking us through this slide, or is this one me? Yes, I'll be talking everybody through, so thanks, Richard. Right, I'm handing over to you then, thanks. Great, thank you. So the DSA contains a multitude of new rules and follows a tiered regulatory system. So all of the digital intermediary services, so those mere conduits, caching and hosting services, online platforms, they'll be subject to basic rules, which are then supplemented by further special duties, depending on the classification of those services. So the obligations that apply particularly to hosting services will include uh, designating a legal representative in the EU, providing an electronic point of contact for both authorities and users in the EU, ensuring transparency in respect of terms and conditions with your service users. So that will include making terms publicly available and easily access um, in clear and plain an easily understood language and that will need to cover certain terms as well so um, things like having policies and procedures in place for content moderation any algorithmic decision making that's taking place and any internal complaint handling systems as well um, some of the other obligations as well includes publishing an annual transparency report around content moderation activity, cooperating with EU authorities to remove illegal content, uh, an additional obligation to report criminal offences, 
the obligation to implement a notice and action mechanism for illegal content and to provide a statement of reasons where action has been taken against a user's account or content. So over the next few slides, we'll do a deeper dive through some of these obligations. So first we'll tackle the accountability um, section of those obligations. So providers of intermediary services, so our mere conduits, caching and hosting services, online platforms, they need to designate a single point of contact as the direct contact for communication with member state authorities, the European Commission and the European Board for Digital Services. There must also be a single point of contact for service users to communicate directly and rapidly with the business. So the same contact point can be provided for both EU authorities and EU users. Providers of intermediary services that do not have an establishment in the EU, but offer services to recipients in the EU must designate a legal representative. So that can either be an individual or an entity that is physically present in one of the EU member states where its services are offered. This principle may be well known to a number of you as a result of the GDPR. So the legal representative must be equipped with sufficient power and resources to enable them to act as a contact person for EU authorities and to cooperate with requests made of them. And the name and the contact details of that legal representative needs to be made publicly available, easily accessible and kept up to date. But most notably, the legal representative can be held liable for a failure to comply with the obligations um, of a service provider under the DSA. So you need to really give some careful consideration to this representative appointment. So if I pass back to Richard to talk us through some of the um, more particular content moderation obligations. Thanks, Eilish. And this is where we're really getting to the heart of the DSA, because ultimately it's really around providing um, a safe online space for users and ensuring digital safety. So a huge aspect of that is content moderation. And this is where the DSA seeks to impose obligations on providers to actually both enable users to inform them of illegal content on their service and also to take steps to actually action those notices, respond and remove illegal content. Um, and there are two kind of aspects to this. Firstly, providers have to publish a notice and action mechanism. Effectively, that's a mechanism that enables individuals or, you, uh, or entities to report suspected illegal content on the service. And that's not just service users, but it's any third party individual or entity can actually um, use that mechanism to issue reports. Um, and that has to be publicly accessible, it has to be easy to use, um, and it has to be user friendly. And many services already have these type of mechanisms, but the DSA sets out some specific requirements as to the form and the content of that mechanism. On the flip side, if you provide a mechanism that enables third parties to tell you about illegal content, you also have to take action in response to that notice. So if you review the notice and you decide, yes, that is content that should be removed, it violates our terms or it's otherwise illegal, then if you take steps, you actually have to uh, inform the user that's affected, the, the owner or the poster or the publisher of that content, and you have to provide an explanation. And this is what's called the statement of reasons. So you have to, where you have their contact details, reach out to that user and provide an explanation as to why you've taken action against them, to remove content, to block content, to restrict access to their content. And you have to give certain information to them as to, that, as to their rights and their remedies in that situation and the grounds you're relying on to take action. So effectively, both of these um, processes are established to make sure that there's a, a, an ability for users and individuals to inform you that there's illegal content, but to also protect the rights of users who might be affected by those takedown notices. And that these two are really process driven. So there's an aspect of publishing something online and providing that mechanism publicly, but also reviewing your back end processes to make sure that you're able to actually handle those notices and respond to them effectively. So let's now move on to the next broad category of obligations, the reporting obligations. I'll hand back to uh, Eilish now. 
Great, thank you, Richard. So if we first tackle transparency reporting, so providers of intermediary services that tackles all of the categories that we've discussed so far, they need to publish reports on the content moderation that they've carried out during a relevant period. And these reports need to be made publicly available at regular annual intervals. So the reports need to include information such as the number of orders that providers have received from member state authorities, the human resources that are dedicated to content moderation within the organization, uh, the number of accounts and items of content that has been taken down e either voluntarily by a provider or based on receipt of a notice, as Richard's just spoken to you about, um, and as well the accuracy and the rate of error of some of the automated content moderation sy systems, if that's applicable to you. So that's just a, a flavor of some of that information that needs to be provided. The reporting obligation under the DSA already applies to those VLOPs and VELOCES and they prepare and publish their transparency reports every six months and as a result some of the uh, reports from those platforms started to become available in around November of last year. The European Commission intends to issue an implementing regulation in the first few months of this year with the aim to improve the quality and the degree of harmonisation of reports. So the European Commission very recently published draft, impl draft implementing legislation and that's currently out for consultation and that closes on the 24th of February. So we've provided a link in the slides if you want to go and review the draft and contribute to the consultation but we just wanted to share some of our key takeaways from the proposal so far. So the Commission is essentially seeking to harmonise reporting standards for all of the providers that are caught by the DSA and require each provider to adopt the same template and follow the same reporting periods. The Commission has published a template that requires detailed and quite granular reporting of information and that needs to be broken down by calendar month and providers need to use the template that's been provided by the Commission and won't be able to rely on their own form going forwards. The European Commission has also confirmed some likely reporting periods for timeframes. So just to give you a bit of a flavour of that, uh, based on the current proposal, providers would need to publish their first transparency report no later than the 28th of February of next year in 2025. That would be for the reporting period 17th of February to 31st of December 2024. Then for subsequent years, the reporting period will run the full calendar year, so from the 1st of January to 31st of December. The publication deadline would be no later than two months after the the end of the reporting period, so the following February or the end of. There'll be no flexibility in those reporting periods and deadlines and that will be harmonised across all providers for comparability purposes. For now, those requirements are only proposals, so they may change, they may soften following the consultation, but it's an area that we think will require a bit more consideration and effort than perhaps everybody first anticipated. So we'd really recommend that you give some particular thought to this obligation and how you might build, build and enhance existing processes and data capture to make sure that you can still comply with those transparency reporting obligations after the February deadline. And then just a note on the monthly active users. So this is for online platforms and they must report on average monthly active recipients in the EU every six months. So those figures need to be made available in a publicly available area of a provider's online interface. So essentially their website. The European Commission published guidance in uh, January of last year in order to help those online platforms with calculating their figures. And we should note as well that the DSA doesn't specify the format or location of reporting their monthly average users, uh, but many online platforms have started to include brief statements on their websites. Um, so sometimes this is featuring on legal, trust and safety or corporate hubs, sometimes help pages or sometimes some DSA specific web pages. Um, but it's important to note to our listeners that the purpose of publishing this information is for the European Commission to be able to identify online platforms that might meet the VLOP VLOS threshold of over 45 million users within the EU and therefore subject to those much more onerous obligations that we've spoken through. And I will now pass over to Richard to talk through some of those additional obligations for our platforms.
Yeah, great, thank you. And it is worth clarifying that that last obligation that Eilish was talking through, the requirement to publish user figures, that applies to online platforms. It's not relevant for hosting services or other services that are not subject to those additional platform obligations. Um, and it, suffice it to say, that's not the only additional obligation for online platforms. There are a large number of other requirements that apply if you meet the threshold to qualify as a platform. And we've summarized those key obligations on the screen here. Suffice it to say, there's not enough time today to go through all of these in detail, but they can be broadly split into two categories. One is the additional rules around how a platform moderates content. That includes, for example, providing users with a complaints and redress mechanism to ensure that that platform is uh, fair and gives users uh, an ability to seek legal recourse in the event that they think that they've been treated unfairly. Uh, and another aspect are trusted flaggers. So platforms actually have to respond to notices submitted by trusted flaggers with priority. They have to prioritize those notices and respond um, without undue delay. And what's a trusted flagger? Well, that's a new regime that the DSA establishes. It's, it says that certain individuals and organizations may have particular competence or expertise in moderating um, activities online and promoting online safety. They have to be appointed and designated within EU member states, so it's an official designation. Once they are designated, then platforms need to uh, prioritize uh, any notice that they receive from those organizations. And also platform misuse, that falls within this category. That There are specific rules in terms of users that misuse the uh, notice mechanism or otherwise abuse the platform in terms of uh, disseminating or sharing unlawful content and how you're effectively going to tackle those nuisance users. Then we move into the second category of additional obligations for platforms. And really these are around ensuring more broadly that the platform is a safe space and that there's transparency around how content is recommended and displayed to users. So the first is that platforms have to be transparent with users around recommender systems. So algorithms that recommend particular types of content to the user and how users may be profiled um, to display content to them. And platforms also have to be aware of dark patterns. So any online interfaces that potentially um, are deceptive or manipulate uh, users into uh, making decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make. We know that dark patterns are already regulated indirectly under other laws like consumer protection law and the GDPR but the DSA is going to impose specific requirements on platforms uh, and a prohibition on dark patterns from next month. Another big part uh, piece for online platforms is to consider is digital advertising, so increased transparency on who is paying for adverts shown to users on the platform um, and on whose behalf the ad is displayed, but also some bans, some actual prohibitions on targeted advertising to children under the age of 18 and a ban on targeted advertising that's based on profiling using special category data under the GDPR. So a tighter and more restrictive regime around digital advertising for platforms going forward. And then last on that list, we have publication of user numbers as well that Eilish has already discussed. So yes, there are quite a lot of things to think through and some of these go beyond that core of content moderation. They are starting to uh, implicate other things more around transparency and consumer protection. So if you do qualify as an online platform, there's a, a lot more work to think through in terms of DSA requirements. Right, well, at this point in time, hopefully your head isn't spinning too fast. We've gone through at a high level some of the requirements under the DSA and you're thinking, right, but what do I do now and um, how do I approach the DSA? So now uh, we'll go back to Mark, who is going to give us a little bit more practical pointers on what you can be thinking about now. Thank you, Richard, and um, and also to Eilish for the, the overviews of these various obligations. Um, 
obviously, as I said right at the beginning, this um, DSA has been around for a while, but it's suddenly going to become applicable on the 17th of February of uh, 2024. So it's really, as we're beginning to talk about during this session, it's thinking about what's in scope and what's out of scope. Because to assess your DSA compliance obligations, you need to really be having a look at your products and your services on a case by case basis. Um, thinking about those DSA obligations, but um, yeah, assessing where you are now, may the DSA catch me? And when we say case by case, it could be this element of this product or service, this other element of product or service. You may be running two hosting services and three online platform services within your service suite. So it's not an all one size fits all kind of assessment, really the case by case assessment of the different uh, functionality and features within your services is important. I think also what's important as a part of that um, is, is being able to apply the categorization to these products and services when you get there. Am I a mere conduit? Am I a host? Am I an online platform as a result? Um, and linked to that, also, what might I do in the future, or what might product, what might product releases or product changes do in the future to change that categorization? It's very easy, we realise, when working on a number of assessments, to find something that is really borderline in terms of an online platform assessment. You know, we come to a fairly nuanced decision that it's not an online platform, but then the business needs to think, well, what do I need to think about? What might change in order for, to, to bring me within that classification? So ongoing monitoring and thinking about that and having a mechanism to think about changes and change introduction and scope group, which may make changes to those categorizations. Once you've considered your classifications and highlighted them on that case by case basis, it's really a case of then thinking about you know, a gap analysis around existing processes and procedures. We're spending quite a lot of time looking at, well, we already do some of this with the DMCA, or we already have a notice and contact page, but it doesn't specifically talk about um, our, our relationship with the, uh, uh, with, the, with the DSA. So maybe we can you know, have this trust and safety team also take reports, or maybe we've got an EU representative for the GDPR. Does that representative offer services that may act as a representative for us for uh, uh, online purposes under the, under the DSA? So thinking about that, those gaps, your existing procedures, how you can change processes and make modifications uh, in the, the most Im or the least impactful way to your business. Now, what's difficult about this is it's really not a case of just making a change to the online terms and getting on with it. A lot of the time, those processes involve uh, actual changes, coding changes, um, changes to multiple pages on the website. So as that 17 February deadline approaches, start thinking about that and thinking about the kind of changes and internal notifications you may need in order to make sure you're, you're up and running by that deadline date. Uh, and then you know, also you may be able to build and enhance your processes, you know, thinking about building and working through uh, of those and focusing you know, then on what you're doing around those gaps, how user facing notices, processes and interaction will deliver an outward facing level of compliance. Remember, this is one of those laws where um, it'll be fairly easy to go to a party's website work out from that website whether somebody is compliant or not, or a business is compliant or not, and then you know, do your own level of gap analysis to see what's missing. Um, it's not a case of hidden internal compliance, this is external compliance, and there really are some quick wins which you can implement uh, in order to show that you've considered the DSA, you've considered your categorization, uh, and there are changes are made um, in relation to this European legislation. So yeah, quite a, quite a bit to think about, um, different ways of doing that. Eilish, Richard, others in the team have been uh, working on this, this for a while and we'd, we'd be more than happy to sort of talk and, and, and think about that as, as you move and think about your, your own roadmaps, particularly those of you who are hosts and those of you who maybe thought about the, this but then postponed it to a 2024 project. Um, so um, hopefully that's a, a useful overview for you. Of course, there are always other ways to hear more from the team. We've got our privacy and security and information blog. Many of you will be familiar with that. All of these recordings and, uh, and, and other 
uh, webinars and overviews are posted to our Silicon Valley YouTube channel. Link here to find out more. We've also got an emerging and um, yeah, and really quite interesting bite-sized podcast with various, you know, in, to, in, in short 10, 12 minute snippets over viewing uh, issues. And you can find uh, and access some of that content at uh, the uh, Buzzsprout link on the, on the right of this slide. Um, that really leaves it to me to say thank you to, to Richard and thank you to Eilish for helping uh, today. Um, if you're looking for more, um, some others in our team, led by uh, Flick Fisher, um, will be uh, yeah, getting together next month, February the 8th, a new year, new rules, looking at more of those digital regulations in 2024. Obviously, we've given you a good flavor of DSA, but there's more within that digital agenda, and they're gonna be looking to find some practical and bite-sized steps to, to think about what really might be impactful for businesses. To, to let you think ahead for the uh, the coming uh, year of 2024. So um, that just leaves me, Mark Weber, to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, hopefully seeing you on uh, one of our communications or webinars sometime soon. And uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.